за сайн байтганы хүмүүс үзэж тээ. Өнөөдөр манай де факто нэвтрүүлгийн зочноор зургийг бид нар энд английн Кембридж хот дээрэд Кембриджийн их сургуульд Кингс Коллеж дээр одоо авж байна. А өнөөдөр юм манай зочин бол Монгол судлаач та бүхний Монголчуудын сайн мэдэх профессор Каролин Хамфри орж байна. Каролин Хамфри Эх Британи эрдэмтэн антропологч. 1943 онд төрсөн Кембриджийн их сургуулийг нийгмийн антропологчийн бакалавр зэрэгтэй төгссөн. 1973 онд докторын зэрэг хамгаалсан. 2003 онд Монгол улсын их сургуулийн хүндэд доктор болсон. Сибир, Балб, Энтхэг, Монгол, Өвөр Монгол, Узбекистан, Украинд уг сатны зүүн судалгаа явуулсан туршлагатай. 1986 онд Кембриджийн их сургууль дээр Монгол ад судлалын тэнхмийг үүсгэн байгуулсан. Hello. 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 Very nice to be here in uh, Cambridge. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, please tell us your connection with Mongolia, how, how you have started and what are you doing? Well, I am a social anthropologist and after I graduated from Cambridge University, mm -hmm. I really wanted to study um, the socialist world because that at that time, this was the 1960s, 1970s, it was very little known in the West and so I thought it would be so important and exciting to travel into the socialist world and understand how people lived. Mm -hmm. So first of all I went to Russia and I was um, a graduate student at Moscow State University mm -hmm. and from there they sent me to Buryatia mm -hmm. and so I spent some months in Buryatia mm -hmm. quite close to the Mongolian border. Mm -hmm. And the people there, they said, oh, we're Russified. If you want to really understand our culture, you have to go to Mongolia. So after I finished that work, I went back and I started to study Mongolian language and Mongolian history and culture. And then yeah. I, here uh, in Britain, yeah. and then I first went to Mongolia in 1970 mm -hmm. to an international conference. Mm -hmm. so yeah. You went to Mongolia to the international conference in 1970. Yes. What uh, faculty of the Moscow State University you have there? Well, I was in the history faculty, the Department of Ethnography. Mm -hmm. Ethnology, Ethnography. Ethnography. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, the Moscow State University has this tradition also, uh, studying ethnography all around uh, the former, at that time, Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So you came to Mongolia in 1970. It was uh, quite a time of, uh, of the peak of, I would say, a, a Cold War. It should be quite different ideology. And yes, it was. Those days were very different and I think I was almost the only Western student there at that time. And there were very few embassies at that time. The British-Mongolian relations had started, but um, so there was a em British embassy there, but I almost had no contact with them. I was in the um, Mongolian State University, mm -hmm. and I was studying Mongolian, and my teacher was uh, Professor Lopsanjav, mm -hmm. and I studied Mongolian language, culture, and um, cul all kinds of social things. I was there in 1972 to 3 for one year mm. and then I went again in 1975 again for quite mm. a long time. Ta losunj bakshi samit dugas. Yes, I samit samit. Ta losunj Mm -hmm. Oh, if you excuse me, I'll speak yeah. in English. Um, well, I was a great admirer of Lobsanchov. Uh, he um, had an, a very original theory of the Mongolian grammar and language, which at that time was very different from the one that was being uh, promoted by the Soviet-influenced mm -hmm. linguists. And um, I think he really brought me to understand the nature of the Mongolian language. Mm -hmm. And of course, he associated language with 
uh, many other aspects of culture. Mm -hmm. So he could talk about symbolism, about uh, Mongolian values, that w what the herdsman really values in his life, mm -hmm. the techniques of herding, all these things are interconnected. Mm -hmm. And in that period I was able to travel outside Ulaanbaatar um, with another teacher who was called Damding, Damding Baksh, mm -hmm. and we went to Arhangai. Uh, we travelled, we stayed with the families of Mongolian herders and so this was very interesting for me at the time. And of course all these people were in the Nigdil, mm -hmm. it was a Ichtamur mm -hmm. Nigdil, mm -hmm. and I met this uh, big chairman of the Nigdil who was called Minjur, Minjur mm -hmm. yeah. and Minjur uh, Batr. Batr, yes. Batr. Yes, and um, so uh, that was wonderful, very interesting for me. Um, yeah, and uh, it of course related to my work previously in the Soviet Union where I had worked in two collective farms mm -hmm. in Boryatia. Mm -hmm. So I was able to compare the Mongolian Nikdil mm -hmm. and the Soviet collective farm. And you, you were uh, writing about ethnography, yes. the Mongolian ethnography. Yes, so I wrote first of all a book about the Soviet collective farm, this Boryat collective farm, which was called Karl Marx Collective. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I wrote some articles about the Mongolian case. Tamir. Ich Tamir Sum and uh, other parts of okay. Mongolia, yeah. Since then also you went to Inner Mongolia, I understand, to yes. China. And, yes. And you studied more that ethnography. Yes. Well, later um, I was asked by my teacher of Mongolian, who is Urgunga Onan, uh -huh. who comes from, he's Daur Mongol, uh -huh. comes from China. Uh -huh. uh, he left China after the war, uh, he really did not like communism, he did not like the Chinese, <laughs> so he didn't want to live in China. Uh -huh. And he followed uh, Latimore Bugs to America, uh -huh. and then when Latimore was punished by the McCarthy uh -huh. people, who, he came to England with Urgunga. Uh -huh. And Urgunga then met me and he said, I would like to write a book with you, or I would like you to write my book about my religion, which uh -huh. is shamanism. Uh -huh. So I wrote a, a, a long book with Urgunga called um, Shamans and Elders. Yes. Yeah. Nowadays, mm -hmm. in Mongolia, you know, this is free country, you know, this is different than the before. Somehow this shamanism, boom, this idea came yes. out very strongly. Yes, what yes. What do you think about it? it? Why is it by chance or why they would be so active now after so many years in Mongolia? Well, I think it's not by chance, because um, shamanism is a religion which is very interested in the whole cosmos, the whole world around, and the powers in the world, or the spirits in the world, and um, so it's got a lot of opportunities for people to think about, you know, other worlds or their relation with other people, and so what I've seen of the modern Mongolian shamanism is a bit different from the Daur case, because um, this was old one uh, based on Urgunga's memories. And today people, the shamanism is almost kind of international, it seems to me, yeah. and uh, even cosmic, because the shamans today are um, inviting spirits from planets far away or talking about um, things that would be impossible in the old times. But something of the religion has stayed the same, I think, which is that people can, um, they can talk with spirits, they can f discuss their problems, they can maybe get some solution to their problems through this. Is it a quite a, a Asian phenomenon, Mongolian, or the, the, the American Indians also have type of? Yes, they do. I don't know very much about the American Indian case. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the Mongolian is maybe similar to something in Korea uh -huh. and also, of course, in places like Buryatia, Tuva. Is it something that people have uh, created in history? Or do you think that we have still a certain spirit that, uh, for example, shamans Bo in Mongolia say that they are calling somebody spirit, God, mm. yes. and they talk to them? Yes. I mean, is it real or it is just that it's something that people create in mind and explaining it? This is a very difficult question. Um, I think it's real in the sense that people really do um, 
interact with something that's different from themselves, which comes through the shaman. Mm. Whether this thing is a real spirit or whether it's um, the shaman is creating it, I find it difficult to say. Yeah. Nevertheless, it shaped the culture we have, yes. certainly, and then it was let on the Buddhism was introduced yes. to Mongolia. Mm -hmm. And then later on, we were forbidden to believe in a god. Mm -hmm. And as a result, people now confusing both culture, actually. Mm -hmm. You mean they're confusing Buddhism and shamanism? Uh, partially in Mongolia. Yes. And, uh, many, I mean, because it's several generations of non-religious atheism, mm -hmm. a theory came out, and then uh, we have gone through exactly my generation now. And, uh, but however, it was a shaping we, we were trying to identify ourselves mm, under yes. this communist ideology. Yes. And you have studied Mongolia through that period. You know Mongolia of that time. Mm. And probably you are in a very interesting position to tell us about the uh, role, mm. how much shamanism and this, our older culture shape it up our, the way we look at the world. What do you think? Well, I think it shaped it very much. And even in the period of socialism, I think it was still very important. Um, in fact, although religion was forbidden, I know, of course, there were some former lamas who were very influential people. Uh, maybe there were for, former shamans. I didn't meet them, but I, I did meet one or two former lamas. And um, I think they had a big moral influence. Mm -hmm. You know, when people were trying to decide what is the right thing to do, uh, I have a problem here, I could do this, I could do that, uh, what is the best way? And the Lamas would give advice to people. Mm -hmm. So I think that was true even in the socialist time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised that it's now very important. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have been obviously visiting several times. How mm -hmm. often do you go to Mongol? Well, I go, ooh, it depends, uh, um, maybe every two, three years, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And obviously you observe the huge changes we have experienced yes. for the last 10, 20 years. Yes. How do you see that changes? Does it help us to make, to be a better nation? Or how do you see the changes in Mongol? Well, I think it is very good that Mongolia is more independent now. So, um, politically, no longer completely under the Russians that, like they used to be. So, Mongolians can make their own decisions, the kind of government they want, the kind of economy they want. I think that's very good. Of course, Mongolia's form-wise changed its Ulaanbaatar city is different than mm. uh, some years ago. But however, this booming based on mining yes. is not coming to every house. No. And uh, <clears throat> you have been also studying uh, the way how Mongolians were making value, or mm. creating the food in, in economic terms. What would be your expectations, I'd say 10 years from now, the way how Mongolia goes and what's going to be there? Well, I think it's very important that somehow the government makes good balance between the mining influence and the other parts of the economy mm -hmm. because it would be a really a pity if mining came to dominate everything yeah. and the whole economy based on, which is so old and traditional, the economy are based on herding livestock if that would be somehow destroyed or deformed so that only very, very poor people are in the herding and all the rich people are in mining, I think this would be a very a great pity. And it's um, also important to develop other aspects of the economy which are, um, you know, more varied things like manufacturing and so on. So I think it's important that Mongolia should um, create the value in their own country, if possible, mm -hmm. so not just become a shipping of raw materials to China or raw materials to Russia or Japan, Yet but create the value in your own country, yes. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the Mongolians now find and they demand the government do exactly to do the same thing, what you just described. 
you know, my concern is we down the road, when mm. everybody moves in the town, mm. we will lose this Mongolian identity which is mm. coming with nomadic life. Yes. How you, we can avoid, how can we keep that tradition? I think it's perfectly possible. I published, in fact, a book a little while ago with a colleague called David Sneeze. Mm -hmm. It was called The End of Nomadism? Mm -hmm. Question mark. Mm -hmm. So it was asking, is nomadism doomed? Is it going to just completely disappear? And uh, our answer was, no, it doesn't have to disappear. It does depend on mobility. It depends that the herds need to move around mm -hmm. because the pastures demand it. Yes. But the people, all of them, they don't have to move. They can develop um, very good um, towns in the countryside with modern facilities, um, you know, sanitation, electricity, internet, all this kind of thing. And some people can take the herds round. Mm -hmm. And to make this successful, you have to invest. You have to put some technological support mm -hmm. so that people can move easily uh, with trucks or other ways of helping them to yes. move and then I think it's perfectly possible to develop mm -hmm. the livestock economy in a way that's um, good for the environment, it keeps the conservation of the wildlife and this kind of thing, but also a high standard li of living for the any, pastoralists. Any example in any, uh, any other countries? Um, well, I suppose, I, I don't know very well, but maybe s countries like Australia and so on, mm -hmm. or even in Britain. We have huge numbers of sheep in Britain, mm -hmm. um, cattle in Australia, the same thing, mm -hmm. and those people live quite a normal life. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good to keep some f flexible system. I don't know what it can be, but it is very important. It should, people should be able to move. I think this is important because the example of Inner Mongolia mm -hmm. shows that when they gave the people this Wuljur and they gave them a fence pasture, mm -hmm. it was not good for the, for the environment. Mm -hmm. And the pastures are degradating in China, mm -hmm. they're, they're becoming very sandy and so on. And now, um, in fact, they've had to abandon a lot of pastures because they're so bad in China. Uh, and this is a really bad system in fact. When they have Chinese given the Uwil uh, to herdsmen and now they are I mean changing the system. Yes. Well they g I think they gave it started giving them in the beginning of the 1980s uh -huh. after the uh, economic reforms and so. they had this so-called household system. Uh -huh. So each household was given an area of land. It wasn't exactly private but uh -huh. it was maybe for 50 years or uh -huh. something like that. But the problem was then they put all their animals in to one place yes. and it destroys the place. They, they were yeah. more concentrated on the place they have given. Yeah. Yeah. But that's very good uh, and on time, I think, a reminder for Mongolians to think about the issue of giving that Obujo to a yes. herdsman mm -hmm. where he will try to create this township for yes. himself and mm -hmm. his children. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, and. Uh, what else, how do you see other possibly Mongolians other than mining can do? Um, well, I think they can uh, be involved in production of, of um, well, they already are, but they can develop, you know, leather good production or other things based on what's produced in Mongolia. Um, and from mining, they can also manufacture um, things rather than export it, mm -hmm. as I said before. And they can be involved in trade in, in that case. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now let's a little bit talk about your university here. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have been teaching all the time after graduation here? Yes. How long do you work here? Oh. At the university? Well, 30 years or something. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, have you, how many Mongolians, to your best knowledge, come through the university? Quite a few. I, I've uh, really tried to encourage that. Mm -hmm. Because in 1986, I founded uh, the Mongolia and Inner Asia Studies Unit, which is specially dedicated to study of this region. Mm -hmm. And in that um, f unit, we have some funding for exchanges for mm -hmm. students and visitors from Mongolia and 
places near Mongolia to, to Cambridge. And we've had um, maybe four or five PhDs mm -hmm. from Mongolia and several students doing MPhil degrees mm -hmm. and many, many visitors. And yeah. I, I think it's thanks to you and your fund. I remember even the uh, communist time, people mm. were going to Cambridge yes. for short or long term. And yes, uh, yes. Well, this is, you already played an important role in shaping up our education system. We tried to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, recently the Mongolian government uh, said they will give a scholarship mm. who, to students who were able to enter to number 100, first 100, mm. 120 schools number one, I mean, world-class universities, including oh, Cambridge, mm. if they are entered into, yes. if, they, if they succeeded, mm -hmm. then the government is going to give us scholarship Excellent. Now. Excellent. That's very, very good news. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, quite uh, new news yes. recently. Yes. And, of course... Uh, In the past, we had to get this funding from other places, mm. and this is one case where these big international companies were helpful, because, for example, um, one of our PhD students from Mongolia here was uh, Bomochir Dolom, mm -hmm. who is now a very successful teacher in Mongolian mm -hmm. State University, or Mongolian National University, and his PhD was <coughs> to some extent funded by us in Cambridge, mm -hmm. but also by um, an oil company mm -hmm. uh, called Soko International, at that uh -huh. time working in Mongolia, and they gave a grant. So. We can make some kind of collaboration yes. to help in these which things. In field he is, doctor? He's in social anthropology. Social anthropology. Social anthropology is becoming very popular in Mongolia. Good. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what does it make? Well, social anthropology is the study of um, the society and the culture of um, different places and comparing them. So. Um, for example, they would investigate the different areas of Mongolia, mm -hmm. um, maybe people, different groups in Mongolia like Dachet Mongols or Buryat or uh, Bayat or, or different kinds of groups, how they live, what are their ideas, um, how do they organize their economies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the world has become a very global now in Mongolia, still people talk about make a differences about Buryats, Oirats, Mongols. I mean, mm -hmm. which to me doesn't sound quite economically correct. What do you think? Well, the idea of our unit was that all of these groups, Mongol-speaking groups, have something in common, and that's why we should study them together. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, we didn't make the group just focus on Mongolia itself, but we included this wider area. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this would include people living in Inner Mongolia, Manchuria, Buryat, Tuva, Kalmyk, all these mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's um, politically they're never going to join up together now, I don't think. It's mm -hmm. not realistic. Mm -hmm. But um, still they should maintain good contact and, and have a, a kind of um, collaborative relation with each other, I think, mm -hmm. and know about each other. Mm -hmm. So I try to encourage my Mongolian students mm -hmm. not to study Mongolia because they already know Mongolia. They should go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So for example, I recently had um, a Mongolian graduate student, his Basenjov. Mm -hmm. He went to study Kalmyks in Kalmykia. Mm -hmm. And this was very, very interesting for him. Mm -hmm. It was uh, when Chinggis Khan was uh, entitled to Chinggis Khan, almost about the same year, no? Mm -hmm. the, the foundation, the yes, yes. And uh, it is it's the world oldest university? No, I don't think so. But it's one of the old ones, well, yes. So, like a Sorbonne or a Cambridge yeah. Oxford, right? Yes. Mm. And uh, now this uh, Cambridge uh, University is, is consistent of many College. colleges? Yes. And each college is in the, uh, Cambridge University? Yes. In our Yes, each college um, is, uh, originally the university was almost like a kind of religious foundation, mm -hmm. so each college was like a monastery. Mm -hmm. If you can um, 
imagine in Mongolia this um, mm -hmm. big monasteries in Dahore mm -hmm. in the old times. Each college was like that. So it was a building with its own members mm -hmm. and teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, then gradually they all united into one. So now they're all part of one university. Uh, it's very hard to enter to this Cambridge University. It should mm. be also expensive. Yes, it's hard to enter because this is an international university and we have people applying from every country in the world, very large numbers. Um, and yes, it's expensive now, unfortunately, more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily agree with our government policy, but the government policy is to charge the high fees. Mm -hmm. And um, they used to give a bigger sum of government money to the university, mm -hmm. but now they give less, and so the university has to charge higher fees. Right. Yes. Uh, and what does it take to be in the university here? Well, first of all, you have to have very good English language because um, all the teaching is in English and there are, it's very intensive teaching. Mm -hmm. So people have to read lots of books and articles quickly and understand them. So you can't do that if you don't have very fluent English. And um, then I suppose you need a good general education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the education system is completely different and uh, to you being working here and looking and with studying even in Mongolia and Russia where you see the major flaw in, in our education system what can we do to improve well I think actually I don't know very much about the Mongolian schooling system mm -hmm. and um, about the university I think it already is changing and it's um, because you have more than one university, there's now some competition to be the best department of, of whatever subject it is. And the Academy of Sciences in Mongolia is also now much more international and um, it's got a very high standard. So I think the uh, system is gradually getting much better in Mongolia. That's my impression. Uh, the, uh, uh, closer to the international standard. Uh -huh. And I think, uh, I think I heard the Mongolian government is maybe going to use the Cambridge International Examination System yes, as is. a kind of validation yeah. of the examination's um, quality. And that will also be very good, I think. And because the quality of students will depend also on the quality of uh, teachers. The teachers and plus quality of the uh, primary and secondary schools pre-university. Yes, yes. And there, I think it is not only... The, the, the here, uh, in your system, you, you work a lot with the character of students. Mm. Uh, almost the same level as a knowledge of students. This is quite an old thing in Britain. It started in maybe 200 years ago when they had a reform of the educational system and they introduced these schools, they were called public schools. Actually, they were not really public, but private. But anyway, they were um, designed, I think, because at that time Britain was this kind of imperial power, and they wanted to train people who would go out to parts of this empire in India or Africa and something and rule those countries. So those people had to be very, not just clever, in their minds, but they had to be very honest. They had to be brave, because the British Empire had very few people running huge countries, millions of people, and just a few people had to be law-abiding, honest, running things correctly, following the rules, and that's what they trained them in these public schools. And so that's quite an old thing in our country. But yet that tradition makes it. think. That's what makes British the British. <laughs> I suppose so, I don't know. <laughs> and still yeah. not the tradition of your uh, prints also serving the military. Yes. And trying to, I mean, that's the, something that all young people are expecting and following. Yes, I mean, we don't have national service in the military now, so um, all the young men don't have to go into the army. Uh -huh. They used to, but now it's stopped. 
But I think in general our education system tries to um, tell people that it's important to do public service mm -hmm. and social service for other people. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of um, uh, organizations which um, train young people in that way. Mm -hmm. For example, to go out and help old people or uh, to go and build something in some area where they don't have a bridge or something. These kind of things young people are encouraged to do in our country. And that's why I think you have a very quality young people uh, studying here at the quality university and uh, inventing, innovating many things in science and the world. Yes, yes. Innovation is considered very important. So um, we're the teachers in our schools, they tell people, don't just listen to me, don't just listen to me and write it down. You must think about what I say, and if I'm wrong, you must say I'm wrong. So they, they question the teacher. Uh, that, that's, that's, I think, the demanding culture which makes this <laughs> great quality. Uh, I'm, uh, we are very delightful, and we are very delighted and to talk to you, and to be at this uh, famous university and to convey your message to Mongolian audience. And thank you very much for receiving us. And uh, come back to Mongolia. Thank you very much. It'll be a pleasure.